Good evening. I'm really excited to welcome you to this pet discussion, 100 Years of Daedalus, the birth of assisted reproductive technology. The hashtag this evening is Haldane Pet. And this event is taking place thanks to the generous support of the Anne McLaren Memorial Trust Fund and Cambridge Reproduction. I'm Sarah Norcross, Director of PET, and I will be chairing this discussion. But this event was the brainchild of PET's Deputy Director, Sandy Starr. And so I'm going to hand over to him. I did want to say a few words about why we at PET thought it was important to hold today's event, and also why we're so grateful uh, to the Anne McLaren Memorial Trust Fund and Cambridge Reproduction for supporting it. Last year, we held an event to mark the 200th birthday of the genetics pioneer, Gregor Mendel. And discussion of Mendel leads quite naturally uh, to discussion of this man, uh, JBS Haldane, who was one of the key figures responsible for integrating the ideas of Mendel with the ideas of Charles Darwin. But there was a lot more to Haldane than that. 100 years ago, Haldane gave a lecture in Cambridge entitled Daedalus that was in large part responsible for introducing the idea of in vitro fertilization and assisted reproductive technology more generally into the public imagination. And we at PET believe that in order to understand where reproductive and genetic technology might be going, it's important to understand where this technology has come from. And Cambridge is central to this story in many ways. Uh, even if Haldane's own relationship with the Cambridge authorities was, like most of his relationships, interestingly turbulent. It's also significant that Anne McLaren, who did much to drive forward both the science and the regulation of IVF, was one of Haldane's students. So the organizations supporting this event the Anne McLaren Memorial Trust Fund and Cambridge Reproduction could not be more appropriate. As well as looking back at the Daedalus lecture in Cambridge, we also wanted to look at the way the lecture became an important landmark in science communication and public engagement when Haldane adapted it into the first volume of a remarkable and influential series of books under the heading Today and Tomorrow. I'd like to show you this blurb that was used to promote the Today and Tomorrow series. It says, in every department of knowledge, new discoveries are constantly being made and novel theories of the utmost importance put forward. Too often, these contributions are lost in the files of learned journals and in other inaccessible places. Yet many of them cannot fail to be of the greatest interest to the public. It will be the object of this little series to make such papers available in a handy format. The language we use nowadays may be slightly different to this, but the objective described here is actually fairly close to a lot of what we seek to do at PET a century later. And finally, I wanted to say a word about this man. This is Daedalus, the figure from Greek mythology chosen by Haldane as the embodiment of biomedical innovation. One point that Haldane makes is that whereas other audacious figures in Greek mythology, like Prometheus and Icarus, were eventually punished for their audacity, Daedalus was not. Daedalus constructed a fiendish and inescapable maze, but then, as shown in this 18th century engraving, he himself managed to escape from the maze. And today, when we think about the labyrinthine scientific, legal and ethical questions that surround reproductive and genetic technology, and at PET we spend our whole time thinking about such matters, it's interesting to ask whether these issues constitute a maze in which humanity is destined to stay hopelessly lost or whether we have the wit to stay on top of and in control of our innovations, as Haldane suggested. We're very lucky to have a superb panel of speakers to explore these questions today, 
We have Samanth Subramanian, Professor Max Saunders, Professor Nick Hopwood, and Dr. Chloe Romanis. Samanth is the author of the book, A Dominant Character, The Radical Science and Restless Politics of J.B.S. Haldane. Uh, the reason that I wrote J.B.S.'s biography really quickly was that he was such a, uh, his, his life was so full of character and events. I mean, he uh, was a foremost geneticist, but he was also uh, one of the most ardent socialists and then communists of the mid 20th century. Um, he was for a long time suspected of being a Soviet spy by MI5. Uh, and he fell, uh, fell out of favor with every establishment uh, that he ran into. And finally ended up moving to India, where I'm from in 1957 and living there, becoming a citizen and dying there. So it's a, it's a, it's a life that's full of event. Uh, and I really want to give you a sense of some of the kinds of things that had happened to him uh, in the run up to publishing Daedalus. So Holden first delivered Daedalus as a lecture in 1923. Uh, this was at a Cambridge club called the Heretics Society. And a year later, it was published as a book in this series that Sandy just talked about. At the time, Haldane was in his early 30s, and he had just started as a reader in biochemistry at Cambridge. I mean, the grand hope of always doing a biography is, uh, is to be able to draw connections between the life and the work, and to try to investigate the premise that, in a way, the life produces the work. So hopefully, I can do some of that over here with Daedalus and JBS today. And I want to begin by talking about J.S. Holden, who is J.B.S.'s father. Um, he is the deeply mustachioed guy on the left. Uh, and they both have mustaches, but he's the one with the more fierce one. Uh, J.S. was a scientist as well. He was a physiologist at Oxford. And his views about science deeply, deeply influenced how J.B.S. understood the discipline. Uh, J.S. Holden's specialty was respiration. So it's how humans breathe in air and what factors of physics and chemistry affect this biological function. So he used to run plenty of experiments of this kind in his lab, often using himself as a test subject. He'd seal himself up in a box so that he could breathe in different combinations of oxygen and carbon dioxide. You see him here in a diving suit and he tested himself and his colleagues and even young JBS as a boy uh, during dives in Scottish lakes. But these were not just academic questions for Haldane Sr. J.S. Haldane was a firm believer in taking science out of the lab, using it to improve the lives of people out in the real world. So for example, he studied how indoor air pollution contributed to the deaths of children in the slums of Dundee. Uh, his diving tests were conducted to reduce the death rates among surfacing divers. He went into coal mines to understand how the subterranean air made miners sick and sometimes killed them. So the canaries used to detect dangerous gases in coal mines, those were his idea. And very often he took his son along. He treated him almost as a peer. He asked him to run calculations or put on a diving suit. And as a result, I think two things happened. The first was that young JBS got used to seeing science as a purposeful utilitarian instrument. It wasn't an exercise for ivory towers, but it was a device for practical and social use. And the second thing that happened was that JBS met the kind of people he would never have encountered otherwise as a boy from quite a patrician family. Uh, he met miners and their families. He met divers, sailors, railwaymen. Uh, he learned about the world outside the university and how it often did not treat people well. He learned that the government was often unequal to the task of solving their problems. You know, what made slum residents ill, for example, or how to keep naval divers safe, or why miners died. Some of these people and ideas recur in both minor and major ways in Daedalus. So one delightful aside comes when, as part of the prophesying of the future that JBS does in this essay, he forecasts a prosperity so wide that the coal miners union is able to run a horse in the derby. Uh, but Daedalus's primary theme is the role of the scientist and specifically the biologist in society. 
and I'm quoting here, I believe that the biologist is the most romantic figure on earth at the present day. This is what he writes in Dennis. Biologists held the key to a transformation on the scale of the industrial revolution, JBS thought. They could multiply the yields of farms. They could abolish infectious diseases. They could grow babies outside of wombs. So the improvement of humans as a species and the improvement of human society were for JBS scientific and social goals that were naturally welded to each other. And you can draw a direct line to this from the way his father worked and thought. One additional aspect of the essay to point out here, uh, which is that Daedalus wanders all over the map of human knowledge, almost to a fault. It's very distracting. I mean, there are commentaries on economics and philosophy and physics and philosophy and fiction. Um, at this age, and every age really, JBS is nothing if not fond of showing off the incredible span of his mind. But it also reflects something about his background in that he never actually received a scientific degree at all. As an undergraduate, he got first class honors at Oxford in the classics, and he once took a course in anatomy, which he never finished. So this was the man who wrote uh, Dennis. Just after he finished his degree at Oxford, JBS enlisted in the Black Watch Regiment and went out to the trenches in France. Later, he fought in Mesopotamia as well. Twice, he was invalided, once because a shell burst very, very close to him. Uh, perversely, JBS always said that he enjoyed the war. You know, being a bomb officer, he wrote home, was just the most ripping job one could ask for. And one reason for this, I think, is that he found a kind of acceptance there that he never had at Eton, where he was bullied, when he was young and miserable for most of his time there. And he said he saw the trenches as a more kind of democratic place where the hierarchies were more of rank than class. He told his sister one story about a mess sergeant telling off a colonel for asking for marmalade when there was none. It had been dark, the mess sergeant hadn't seen who he was speaking to. And when he realized, the colonel said, and I quote, don't apologize, Sergeant Major, treat me just like you would the others. So this kind of stuff really warmed JBS's heart. But there were signs that he was dismayed at a deeper level by the war. And I found sort of poems in his notebooks where he talked about great black clouds that hide from the sun, the anguish of the world. There's a story uh, I tell in the book once about half a century after the First World War ended, his sister Naomi saw her brother letting a horse fly feed from the flesh of his hand. And he was kind of watching it patiently, almost kindly. And she asked him if the blood he was giving up was in any way penance for the blood that he had shed. And then she wrote, he disclaimed it so fiercely that it may have been true. And it wouldn't have been surprising if he had been dismayed by the war. I mean, he watched his friends die. He watched a new form of warfare, chemical warfare, in the form of chlorine gas, which was unleashed in the trenches that he was fighting. In. He had seen the ruling class, as he liked to call it sacrifice young men in battlefields. And he wrote later about the ignorance of highly placed persons who refused to listen to their scientists. The war Sigmund Freud wrote in 1915 or 16 brought to light an almost incredible phenomenon that civilized nations know and understand one another so little that one can turn against the other with hate and loathing. And this was very much the kind of impression that the First World War left in anybody who fought in the war or anybody who sent people off to die in the war. In the essay in Daedalus, JBS refers directly to these disastrous effects of the war. He writes about black and yellow masses of smoke, which seem to be tearing up the surface of the earth and disintegrating the works of man with an almost visible hatred. This is the kind of strong language that never actually occurs in the letters where he's talking about enjoying the war. Throughout the essay, he raises the prospect that states and societies will find ways to misuse science, just as they did during the First World War. He writes in Daedalus, man armed with science is like a baby with a box of matches. Having been in the middle of a war that made people wonder if humans would destroy civiliz civilization entirely rather than elevate it, JBS seeded some of that same anxiety in deadness. 
Although JBS was in the biochemistry department when he wrote Daedalus, he was rapidly moving towards a statistical treatment of genetics. In 1924, in fact, he published the first of 10 papers that helped invent the discipline of population genetics. So this was a really crucial moment in the field. For decades, biologists had been trying to reconcile Darwin's theory of natural selection with Mendelian genetics. And the way through, it turned out, was with the help of math mathematical models that JBS and a couple of others developed. But even through this period of uncertainty, before the principles of genetics settled into view, the politics and culture of racial theory had overtaken. So Francis Galton, who, co who coined the term eugenics, wondered, could not the race of man be improved? Newspapers celebrated the birth of what was called England's first eugenic baby, whatever that meant. Her mother, who had read studiously and attended concerts in the theater during her pregnancy, actually named the baby Eugenette. In Britain after the Boer War and then after the First World War, you could also sense a rising anxiety about the fitness of young men. Um, and in the US, on the other side of the Atlantic, states were passing compulsory sterilization laws, trying to pull the unfit, you know, the blind or the epileptic or those from a race considered inferior out of the genetic pool out altogether. So in this kind of ferment over genetics, JBS wrote Daedalus as a way to point to both the promise of the science and the perils of its misuse. Mankind's control over its own reproduction, he thought, would improve the species. You know, generation to generation, for example, the quality of music would get better and the number of theft convictions would diminish. I mean, so this is in Daedalus, a strain of eugenic thinking that JBS would actually later go on to disavow but even while making these predictions, he argues that using the tools of genetics calls for a new, almost secular morality. And whatever that moral code was, JBS wouldn't say, he admitted that it might be altered for the worse by human beings. So he called it giant flowers of evil, blossoming at last to their own destruction. But these disruptions were to be expected and humankind would either leapfrog them or, or stumble in the attempt. But these issues of morality and ethics that surround reproductive technologies and genetics and the future of the human species, the kinds of issues that PET deals with on a daily basis, those are very much alive and perhaps more urgent than even what they were in Aldane's time. Our next speaker this evening is Professor Max Saunders. Max is the author of the book Imagined Futures, Writing, Science and Modernity in the Today and Tomorrow book series. The man who really helped to make the book Daedalus famous was the Cambridge polymath and bookseller and eccentric, as well as clock collector, C.K. Ogden. You can see him here wearing a mask. Ogden said masks helped you listen to the arguments without being distracted by personalities. He was an intellectual entrepreneur, Ogden, and a brilliant editor. He edited the Cambridge Magazine. He edited the journal we'd call Psyche, but I bet he called it CK. He also edited several book series for the publisher Keegan Paul. His most serious one was a huge series, the International Library of Psychology, Philosophy and Scientific Method, which began in 1922 with Wittgenstein's Tractatus, which Ogden characteristically helped to translate, and included landmark textbooks by thinkers like Jung, Adler, Carnap, Husserl, Piaget, and Malinowski, to name just a few, played a really massive part in the intellectual life of the period, as did Ogden. He knew everyone who was doing groundbreaking work, whatever their discipline. Uh, there's the man behind the mask, by the way. Um, as Samant said, he also presided over a Cambridge discussion group called the Heretics, so it was inevitable he'd invite Cambridge's new reader in biochemistry, J.B.S. Haldane, to give a paper. And the talk was exactly the kind of work Ogden wanted to publish, popularising advanced, progressive, exciting ideas with style and wit. He did, uh, managed to persuade Keegan Paul, the publisher, to publish it as a little book, which was striking since it's really pamphlet length, just under 12,000 words. But Ogden must have felt um, rightly that it was substantial enough in content to stand alone. So he effectively launched Daedalus twice, first as a talk, then as a book. When the book first appeared, 
There was no mention of a series, but it soon became clear they had a sensation on their hands. So Ogden asked his friend Bertrand Russell to write a reply, and he took Daedalus' son Icarus as his title figure. I love that second quotation on the dust jacket there, um, where, uh, you know, it, it, which says a lot about Og Ogden's contrarian humour, that they just picked out that phrase from a whole review and made it sound like the selling point of the book, not just ordinary pessimism, but utter pessimism. Um, it was only now that Keegan Paul started advertising these books as part of a series. And this um, page doesn't even show all of them, but it gives you a sense of how it was organized. Um, and the series was called Today and Tomorrow and design, they did, redesigned uh, Deedless to fit the new design of maroon sort of elegant books with cream labels. Um, and it was really the success of Haldane's book, which launched the series, which ran for eight years and eventually to 110 often strange and mostly fascinating volumes, which followed Haldane's pattern of um, looking at the present and then trying to predict the future of whatever it was that people were writing about. A brief introductory note in Didalus says it will be criticised for its undue emphasis on certain unpleasant topics. This is necessary if people are to be induced to think about them, and it's the whole business of a university teacher to induce people to think. Those certain unpleasant topics are mainly sex, and many would have been scandalized in 1923 by the idea that it was even part of the business of the university teacher to induce people to think about that. That subversive humor is characteristic of much in the book and in the series as a whole. In fact, it's not till nearly two thirds of the way through Daedalus that we get to biology, let alone to sex and ectogenesis. What comes first? Philosophy, physics, energy, chemistry. This is science and the future, and Haldane ranges across all of it with panache. He even uh, discusses poetry, which he's also subversive about. He'd studied classical literature at Oxford, uh, as well as maths. And um, it's only then after he's gone through all these things that we get to biology, which he saw as the science with the important work all still ahead of it. We are at present, he said, almost completely ignorant of biology, a fact which often escapes the notice of biologists and renders them too presumptuous in their estimates of the present position of their science, too modest in their claims for its future. You can see why many of his fellow scientists felt threatened. It soon becomes clear that one target he has in mind uh, here was the pseudoscience of eugenics, as um, Samant has discussed, uh, which was then in its heyday. Haldane talks about the half dozen or so important biological inventions which have already been made through history, such as adapting to drinking cow's milk or using fermentation to produce alcohol. These developments too, he says, were first considered heretical. Uh, the chemical or physical inventor is always a Prometheus. There's no great invention from fire to flying, which has not been hailed as an insult to some god. But in, if every physical and chemical invention is a blasphemy, every biological invention is a perversion. So I hope you're getting a taste of the way in which he likes to make us think there. Okay, so now the stage is set for the entrance of the figure of Daedalus. The, the best known parts of the Daedalus myth, which Sandy touched on earlier, are actually about physical inventions. He was the architect of the labyrinth, then devised wings so that he and Icarus could escape from Crete. But Haldane chooses him not so much for these, but yes, you guessed it, because of blasphemous sex. Daedalus also invented a contraption which enabled King Minos's wife to mate with a bull, which produced the um, hybrid creature, the Minotaur, half man, half bull. For Haldane, Daedalus is thus the first biologist, the first genetic engineer. So now Haldane set things up for speculation about what the next biological inventions might look like. And it's here that he introduces the idea that everyone remembered about the book at the time, ectogenesis, the gestating of human embryos completely outside the body in artificial wombs. But even this stunning thought experiment isn't introduced in pompous oracular mode. He does it satirically, imagining some extracts from an essay on the influence of biology on history during the 20th century, which will, it is hoped, be read by a rather stupid undergraduate member of this university to his supervisor during his first term 150 years hence. 
Haldane knows that ectogenesis will be provocative, so he presents it as if it's already old hat, like drinking milk or whiskey. The essay covers lots of other things besides ectogenesis, including genetic modification and even possible accidents with it. He, he imagines one turning the sea purple. And then he's off again to cover medicine, psychology, morality, and religion. The, the book teams with wonderful epigram worthy of Oscar Wilde, things like, it took man 250,000 years to transcend the hunting pack. It will not take him so long to transcend the nation or we must learn not to take traditional morals too seriously. But how seriously should we take Haldane's ideas, especially ectogenesis? Well, it hasn't happened yet, at least not for humans. Um, it has been trialed on sheep, and I'm sure our um, biological experts will have a lot to say about um, sort of how close we are to it now. So why was the idea and Daedalus the book so influential? Well, it was unexpected, certainly highly original. It represented a new way of thinking, of connecting up the science with its social possibilities and transformations. Actually, it barely mentions IVF because he's more interested in asking what would people do next once they had it? Um, but it also represents a tone, I think. To some, that tone might seem arrogant, as when he says people don't understand science, even scientists don't understand science. You know, they can't see how little they know. So who does that leave? Hmm. Um, but, but I think that tone isn't just an expression of egotism. It's a belief that we have to free ourselves from outmoded religious or moral objections to be able to imagine genuine change at all. What really appeals to Haldane about the concept of ectogenesis, I think, is how it would change people's lives, particularly women's lives, by increasing their freedoms, their physical freedom, freedom to work, sexual freedom. As he characteristically put it, if reproduction is completely separated from sexual love, mankind will be free in an altogether new sense. That's quite a claim, that a biological invention can lead to a new kind of freedom. Haldane's audacity here sheds another light on the appeal of the series. For the most part, the books don't issue prophecies or predictions exactly, claims that on a certain year a specific event would take place. They were more about imagining what Haldane called in the title of a book of essays, possible worlds. How do we know whether we want something like exogenesis if we don't think around it, explore all its aspects, how it will affect sex, freedom, work, parenthood, whatever? They are thought experiments rather than prophecies or stories. But in order to think about such possibilities, someone, of course, has to imagine them in the first place. Um, and that's where the visionary part comes in, not divine inspiration like the Delphic Oracle, but the exercise of human ingenuity like the figure of Daedalus. The Today and Tomorrow series is very different from today's data-driven and think tank-led future studies. Um, that work is very good at extrapolating from what we already know and making very precise predictions about you know, things like weather, say. But what it can't do, but what Haldane and several of the other writers in Today and Tomorrow were so good at doing was imagining what altogether new possibilities might lie ahead. It would be very hard for us to imagine better futures if we can't recover the art of doing something like that. I'm pleased to be here with such interesting panellists uh, on such a fascinating topic that, uh, that Sandy has put together. Now, there was um, no single birth of assistance the reproduction or, or the test tube baby. There were dozens of claims to what were reported as test tube babies or steps towards them, and visions of babies in bottles go back much further than that. But Haldane Steedless did work a significant innovation. Um, the success of the concept of ectogenesis rather reframed things, and in this period when the reproductive sciences were being organized for the first time, this wasn't the invention of the word ectogenesis, but it, it was of the concept that we now associate with it, the human development outside a pregnant body from fertilization to the, the decanting, uh, not, not the birth of a child. Now we can see how Haldane changed the context by looking at one piece of work, um, the only piece of work that in uh, 
the relevant passage of Daedalus, he mentioned as being in the past in 1923. Um, he wrote uh, as early as 1901, Heap had transferred embryo rabbits from one female to another. The zoologist Walter Heap described transplanting rabbit over in papers published in 1890 and 1897. Haldane's undergraduate was a bit approximate with the date. They still occasionally are. Heap used two breeds. Um, he took over from the fallopian tube of an Angora doe, previously mated with an Angora buck, and transferred them directly to the tube of a Belgian hare doe, recently mated with a Belgian hare buck. Two of the offspring were Angora. Now, Heap was really interested in animal breeding. But these experiments seem to have had no direct practical application. They aimed rather to explore the influence of the foster mother, including the uh, possibly enduring influence on offspring of a previous mate. Daedalus reframed this technique and made such transfers potentially part of producing new organisms. Now, the second reference. Uh, in 1925, Haldane had grown embryonic rats in serum for 10 days, but had failed to carry the process to its conclusion. I think you can see that this is, this is a joke. Um, the, the condescension of hindsight uh, presents a success as tantamount to a failure. Um, though, as far as I know, Haldane never tried this embryo culture. But there was uh, already um, a certain amount of activity here. Um, so uh, a little later in 1925, the anatomist Warren Lewis at the Carnegie Department of Embryology filmed rabbit embryos dividing in culture, though not for quite that long. You can see the stills from uh, the film here. Um, the zoologist Julian Huxley and embryologist Joseph Needham presented this as a step on the way to ectogenesis and brave new world. As you surely all know, that was the definitive reproductive dystopia by uh, Julian's brother and Haldane's friend, uh, Aldous Huxley, who likely knew what became Daedalus long before it was published. Now, fertilization is only mentioned in Daedalus and presented as straightforward compared with the nutrition and support of the embryo, perfectly reasonably, you might think. And uh, it maybe also had a small role because it was at the time in a bit of a blind spot in research. At least that might be how it would seem to us. Um, there was relevant work being done and debated as part of a, a, a ferment of interest in, uh, in, in biology in, uh, and in reproduction. Um, so artificial insemination was much discussed and starting to be offered controversially by a few doctors. By the mid-1930s, especially in the United States, the children were widely referred to as test tube babies. There was also artificial activation or parthenogenesis to produce development without fertilization by sperm. Um, that had been announced for sea urchins in 1899 and was a big story. Artificial fertilization, so with the sperm, um, that had been achieved long before for species in which fertilization is naturally external. It was the basis of the fish breeding industry. But for mammals, attempts were directed towards producing new stages to observe, not making new organisms. And Daedalus may have reframed this too. It certainly became the frame for such work alongside Brave New World. This is most important for the research that really launched in vitro fertilization as a project. The Harvard physiologist Gregory Pincus, later much more famous for his role in developing the oral contraceptive pill, Pincus had come to the animal research station in Cambridge, England, to try for parthenogenesis in mammals. So fertilization in vitro uh, with the sperm, that was his control. But he then found it hard to show that sperm made a difference and fertilization became an experiment in its own right. By 1934, he's back at Harvard um, and with his colleague Ernst Entzmann, uh, he claimed 
and the first certain demonstration that mammalian eggs can be fertilized in vitro. So they mixed gametes, egg and sperm, transferred the uh, hopefully fertilized eggs to a host uh, female using genetic marking and um, uh, through, through that um, reassured themselves that, um, that, that they had uh, a genuine fertilization. As you can see, um, this is reported in the New York Times, among other places, as the Haldane Huxley fantasy made real. Um, with Pincus and Entzmann as uh, two uh, Bokanovskis. So that's Huxley's fictional embryologist. This is the beginning, I think, of the settling on Pincus's semi-ectogenesis, as it was sometimes called, as the research that would carry forward Haldane's vision to an initially more limited goal. So on the one hand, even tiny advances could appear as significant in relation to ectogenesis. On the other hand, um, whatever scientists might do could now be presented reassuringly as not that. Pincus inspired the leading fertility doctor, John Rock, to envisage what Rock called conception in a watch glass to bypass infertility in 1937. Rock collected unfertilized eggs from fallopian tubes and ovaries removed from patients in clinically indicated operations on days close to ovulation. His assistant, Miriam Menkin, mixed eggs with sperm from uh, medical interns paid to perform in cubicles decorated with Swedish posters of voluptuous nudes. After much trial and error, in 1944, Menken obtained two two cells and one three cell. We're, we're seeing a, a section through one of the two cells. Rock told journalists this was technically the first actual step in test tube babies, although the experiments indicate absolutely no way to produce babies artificially. And that was quite enough to make headlines. Now, there will also be projects on artificial placentas and other techniques for keeping fetuses alive outside the body. And their authors will sometimes appeal to or dissociate themselves from Haldane and Huxley. Historians don't know so much about these, and I might well be biased by my own interests, but I think in vitro fertilization hogs most of what we might call the romanticism of ectogenesis and the brave new world. In the late 1940s, it might have seemed like, following the work of Pincus and Mencken and Rock, they were all set for significant advance. But that work was soon discredited. As reproductive biologists became a larger community, they developed stricter standards. So there's a real sense when Robert Edwards began trying for human in vitro fertilization in the mid 1960s, that he was starting again. When all Edwards had done was repeat Pincus's maturation of human oocytes according to the new standards, new scientists announced, we're out of the realms of fancy now, brave new world is on its way. Edwards built on work on laboratory mammals. Then he and Jean Purdy collaborated with Patrick Steptoe, the British pioneer of laparoscopy. Steptoe and the NS HS team in Oldham delivered Louise Brown on the 25th of July 1978. As Newsweek put it, she was born with a lusty yell and it was a cry round the brave new world. Reproductive biomedicine took off through neither Haldane's state socialism nor Huxley's state capitalism, but mostly private enterprise. Alongside Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Brave New World remained a constant point of reference, especially in the debate over embryo research. Robert Edwards expressed frustration that the novel still gripped the people he called the prophets of doom. And opponents did trade in negative images from science fiction. But as the sociologist Michael Mulcahy showed for the UK in the 1980s, proponents could dismiss these as blatant fantasies, while their own extrapolations were much harder to discredit. And I would add, researchers had long used the Haldane and Huxley visions to attract publicity by making 
tiny steps significant. And then also fed it off criticism by saying they were doing nothing so extreme. Daedalus reframed research as more directed towards the control of reproduction. He gave researchers a sense of purpose and colored how they saw their own work. Although just part of the original vision, the pursuit of in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer was settled on as the main path to the reproductive future, albeit a future that became ever more past. This continual two-way exchange between research and speculation um, deploy Daedalus and Brave New World a good deal more flexibly than is usually appreciated. Um, our final speaker this evening is Dr. Chloe Romanis. Chloe is author of Research and Commentary on Ectogenesis, and she's co-author of the book Early Medical Abortion, Equality of Access and the Telemedical Imperative. She is Assistant Professor in Biolaw at Durham University, and She's currently in the USA because she's a fellow in residence at Harvard University's Law School. Uh, what I am focusing on today is uh, th this concept of exogenesis that comes up in the, in the Daedalus lecture. And there are a growing number of scholars in ethics, law, sociology, gender studies, who are building up a, an increasing literature on this technology. Whilst the term ectogenesis was sort of popularised from this lecture and still remains in, in popular discussion today, increasingly scholars in my field, particularly those who are interested in metaphysics, refer to it as ectogestation, literally just to be very clear about what we mean. So that's gestation outside of the body. And as uh, Professor Saunders explained, this idea is introduced partly in this sort of satirical presentation of an essay submitted by an undergraduate student. But even after this sort of satirical introduction, Haldane does note that he considers the technology probable in the present state of biological science, effectively at some point in the future. So within this um, uh, satirical um, essay, there are a couple of suggestions that just help set the scene, I guess, to evaluate where we are today compared to what some of the suggestions were in the lecture. So in that essay, there was the suggestion that France was the first to adopt ectogenesis officially, and by 1968 was producing 60,000 children annually. And then again, effectively by 2074, less than 30% of children would be of women born. Now, this is obviously very different from the state of affairs that we know to exist 100 years later, where um, France does not have some of the most progressive regulation on reproduction in Europe, uh, nor are there regularly children being born without ever being gestated inside a person with female physiology. But what we do have, or are we are closer to than ever before, um, is a vision of a kind of ectogestation, so a partial ectogestation. But this is somewhat different from the vision of ectogenesis or ectogestation as a reproductive choice and something closer to um, a sort of alternative to conventional neonatal intensive care. So scientists in an, a number of countries across the world have models in development for partial ectogestation in humans with the express aim of making neonatal intensive care better. So the aim there is sort of to take over gestation outside of the body when a pregnancy needs to end prematurely, as opposed to growing entities from scratch outside the body in their entirety. There seems to be a very palpable need um, to improve neonatal intensive care for a number of reasons, right? Prematurity is still the leading cause of death amongst neonates worldwide. And it's also something that a lot of people are sympathetic to, and consequently, it seems less controversial than the idea of developing a reproductive technology to replace a pregnancy. Um, and also, I guess, uh, importantly, despite the fact we're making scientific progress towards um, being able to work with embryos outside of the human body um, in, in labs, sort of um, past the 14 day mark, the law prohibits experimentation on human embryos post 14 days in a, in a significant number of jurisdictions. So that prevents us from developing a technology capable of ectogestation outside of the body. Even if those laws were to be reformed tomorrow, there would then be the long journey um, from coming up with a uh, 
well, being in a space where it's possible to start that experimentation to actually being able to grow embryos through the process of embryogenesis into fetal development and then potentially using these models we already have to facilitate continued fetal development outside of the body. I just want to come back to thinking about this possibility of complete ectogestation to look at some of the con comments made in Daedalus and, and just think about what a world of complete ectogestation might look like and think about some of the ethical and legal questions we might need to anticipate and begin interrogating. So within this essay, this satirical essay that the undergraduate or fictional undergraduate student has written, there is this comment. Um, had it not been for ectogenesis, there can be little doubt that civilization would have collapsed within a measurable time owing to the greater fertility of the less desirable member of the population in almost all countries. And I think there is some uh, alluding here to the perils and concerns that we might draw in the context of ectogestation about eugenics and about coercion. Now, within this statement, there are things that speak out to me that I think also are debates that are happening in, in contemporary context. So you may remember some weeks ago now, there was a concept released by a scientific um, communicator based in Germany that was called Ectolife, which was videos that became very popular of this sort of facility of babies being mass produced, grown entirely outside of the body, ectogenesis, but also featuring other things available at this facility, such as gene editing. And I think what this reminds me of here is firstly just that we ought to remind ourselves of the intention of the current devices being something very different from the mass production of babies in, in such facilities, but also the danger of complicating thinking about ectogestation and what it might bring with featuring things like gene editing within that conversation as something that's a part of it as opposed to something that's distinct and something that's separate. That said, I do think we do need some recognition that pregnancy and, and who's allowed to be pregnant and in what circumstances does play a big role in how we think about eugenics. And there are real fears about coercive uses of ectogestation that have been raised by a number of feminist scholars and commentators, myself included, but also Claire Horne, Julia Cavallari, and a number of others. And within this work, there are concerns about the undertone, and you can almost see it in this passage here, this oh, obviously satirical, but this idea of there being a right and wrong person to reproduce and a right and a wrong person to be pregnant. And within the existing scholarly work, people ask questions about whether if ectogestation were a reproductive choice, how do we genuinely ensure that it is a choice rather than something that people are not pressured to use, for example, so that state or, or, or medical institutions or even partners aren't entitled to more control over a pregnancy. And we might have real concerns about particular groups, for example, people who are socially disadvantaged, people from racialized communities, and so on, falling victim to this idea. And then finally, and this features outside of this um, satirical passage, and Professor Saunders already mentioned it, as this question of, if reproduction is once completely separated from sexual love, mankind will be free in an altogether new sense. And this comment is in line with um, the suggestion of some more recent liberal feminist commentators that suggest that gestation outside of the body will um, bring us to a world where there is more freedom for all people who have the capacity to become pregnant. And while I think it's great here to, to start thinking about choices about bodily labor and reproducing, I think there is a, a tendency to overstate ectogestation as a source of freedom in a way that treats technology as a solution to social problems. And I have issues with that in, in, in several senses because I think we need broader healthcare um, and, and social and ethical and legal reform before we can imagine ectogestation as a tool for liberation for marginalized groups. What I mean by that is we need better maternity care, right? So we need to live in a world where people are not statistically much more likely, for example, um, to die in childbirth if they are um, of a particular um, racial group. And that therefore would mean that people genuinely might be able to make choices about healthcare as opposed to feeling pressured to use 
versions of, of um, out of body gestation. We need better employment rights and better structures um, around those sorts of things so people don't feel the need to use these devices in those circumstances. I'm not completely opposed to complete ectogestation, but I just think we need a lot of societal change first and a lot of conversation um, like hopefully we will have today. Well, that, that very haunting image of the sheep in the artificial womb is still in our minds. Um, am, am I right in thinking from what you're saying that that, that, that experiment is, is an example of only partial ectogestation, in other words, that the yeah. sheep wasn't read entirely in a, in a womb like that? Yeah, so um, there are several teams that have models that are quite similar, um, but that particular one is, is a team based in Philadelphia and it's called Extend Therapy. And the device is dependent on the um, entity within it having fetal physiology. So it relies on things like a pump plus oxygenator. So that means the entity in it has to have a sufficient heartbeat. Um, it also, uh, you know, it has several other functions that mean it, it can't be an embryo, basically. I know it's mentioned in Sandy's introduction, but I still don't really understand why the lecture was called Daedalus. Holden compares uh, the figure of the biologist in the 1920s and thereafter uh, to Daedalus. And I, you know, there's a, there's a number of sort of aspects of this comparison. I can maybe let a, a few other people uh, kind of talk about uh, what they think uh, are most relevant. But the thing that I found interesting, particularly in the context of, the, uh, of what I was talking about, which is um, the need for a kind of moral or ethical code that protects science from misuse, uh, by the state or by um, by other aspects of society, I think that uh, in that context, I think Holden saw Daedalus as somebody who uh, didn't care what the gods thought of his work and sort of did the work, um, you know, sort of unencumbered by any pressures from outside. Uh, and he mentioned he says as much towards the end of the essay. As much as Holden wanted to have biological work be that kind of completely apolitical. Um, work happening almost in a vacuum where the science is developed for science's sake. Uh, the, the conclusion that Holden does come to, I think, is that very, scientists very much need to think about, um, about these kind of pressures and the externalities of the society in which the scientific work is being done. I mean, after he's talked about the Minotaur, he says, it is safe to say that posterity has never equaled his only recorded success in experimental genetics. So, you know, that, that's what I meant by saying he sees um, Daedalus as the first biologist or genetic engineer that he, you know, he was doing experimental genetics in, um, you know, the classical period. Can you share anything about the connection between JBS Haldane and the birth of reproductive technology and the eugenics movement? And then as if that's not enough, um, there's a second bit to the question. And could the panellists reflect on how we should think about this connection today with the potential for heritable germline genome editing on the horizon? Haldane had a relationship to eugenics, though, as has been said, uh, an increasingly critical one towards the mainstream eugenics uh, of his day. Um, in some ways, uh, reproductive technologies manipulating eggs and sperm and and thinking about uh, moving towards ectogenesis could be thought of as uh, more refined ways of achieving uh, certain eugenic goals um, or they could be thought of as as working uh, quite independently of eugenics and I mean it was really quite common for um, reproductive biologists through the middle of the 20th century to be in, in this country members of the eugenics society. Um, that was really pretty uh, standard. Um, it didn't necessarily mean that they subscribed by any means to all of the class and race prejudice that that, that had often characterized eugenics. Um, but but um, uh, but but that was um, that that was really, um, um, I mean, it would be an unusual uh, person working in that field who wasn't in some way interested in uh, uh, what they would think of as quality uh, as well as quantity. Um, connections today, I mean, I think in some ways the most important thing is not to make 
connections too easily because things are rather different and um having these kind of discussions uh the sorts of regulation that are in place the kinds of uh things that pet is promoting um that that's a that's a good way of um thinking about this with respect to uh, any potential use of um uh, germline uh, genome editing in the word eugenics uh has a different kind of valency through the 20th century and into the 21st. Um, and certainly Haldane was not without the prejudices of some of the people um, of his background and of his nationality. And so there are instances in his very early writings um, of straight out racial views. But I think um, to Haldane's credit, uh, as he learns more about genetics himself, and as he becomes sort of more accomplished as a geneticist, uh, he starts to refine and change these views quite a bit, uh, to the extent that at some point he um, very clearly states that he doesn't believe that there is any such thing as a racial group at all, that are population, which is what we now know, um, you know, sort of some of these groups to be. Uh, and, and he doesn't ascribe certain characteristics or certain genetic traits to certain uh, so-called racial groups, and he disowns, certainly by the time the 1930s have come around, he disowns all of the uh, uh, the earlier sort of mildly eugenic views uh, that he had put out. And uh, by the mid-1930s, the, the, you know, the fascists in Italy and the Nazis in Germany, and the kind of blood and soil eugenics that they espouse is something that Haldane speaks out very vociferously against. It's interesting that he was he was a member of a he was you know a member of a troika of population geneticists who helped invent this discipline and one of the others Ronald Fisher was somebody who was much more classically in the mold of what you might call the eugenicist who still had very um, fixed views on race and class that we come to associate with um, eugenics today and Haldane was very different from that. I think that's right and and that I'd go a little further even and say that that yes I mean although there are sort of passages in Holden where he seems to echo some of the the eugenicist kind of preoccupations of the time um, he's actually much more scathing about it as a discipline than most of his peers so and, and and particularly when it sounds like it's becoming something that might be compulsory I mean absolutely endorse what Chloe was saying about you know the coercive potential for for some of this discourse but but Haldane hated that and so he says the eugenic official and of course as soon as it becomes an official it rings alarm bells but the eugenic official a compound it would have appear it would appear of the policeman the priest and the procurer is to hail us off at suitable intervals to a local temple of venus genetrix like a brothel with a partner chosen one gathers by something of a glorified medical board to this prophecy, I should reply that it proceeds from a type of mind as lacking in originality as in knowledge of human nature. So that's Haldane's view about eugenics, really, you know, and, and he doesn't seem to think much of it in passages like that. It is within this, this bit that he does very clearly say, like, this is satirical and stuff, but there were some undertones to, to that piece I pulled out that are quite uncomfortable. And he never like directly responds to them in the rest of the essay. And I'm not saying that he like endorses that particular view, but it's almost like a sense of like accepting that it's normalcy, that that a particular world might come to exist where certain types of people are discouraged from reproducing or prevented from reproducing. And um, I mean, I know it seems far fetched, but like I, I, you do see people making those sorts of arguments. You know, you see that all the time with things like the contraceptive pill like give it to everybody and then only allow certain people to reproduce and so that kind of comment being within the satirical passage and then not being sort of pulled out a bit more is reading it back now obviously a hundred years later it's uncomfortable but um he does say read by a rather stupid undergraduate so the whole thing is framed by that and 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 I think you know that in a way what you might be doing is sort of um, using a more contemporary sense of trigger warnings, you know, that, that, that I don't think his generation felt they needed that. And and, this, the, and yet by framing it as some, uh, something coming from a rather stupid undergraduate, that 
tells you all you need to know. There are lots of other things that you might pin to as the moment where he's identifying that person as being the stupid undergraduate, right? Like Professor Hopwood had another example of an error that student technically made. So you might be calling them a stupid undergraduate for their technical errors, right? It just leaves space for, for questions. What lessons would panellists wish present day bench scientists working on human development to take from the history of development of human reproductive technology? It's useful to ha have a sense of the, the range of possibilities in uh, different periods and then to think uh, in a similar way about the period we're in now and the work that you or those uh, that those scientists are doing now and and really think about the range of options uh, discuss those um, and 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 have a sense of um, what uh, unintended as well as intended consequences might be speculation about reproductive futures is useful um, and I'm saying that obviously because like my research is, is all premised on the idea of technology that's not yet in fruition. Um, and yet there are still really important legal, ethical, social questions that we can think about no matter how far in the future those things are to start thinking about what we need to do before we get there. And I think that's what I really took from reading this essay again is that there, there are so many things within the way that a world of ectogestation is imagined that we, we need to change and that are still contemporary problems. Haldane's answer would be to look back at the time that Daedalus was written and even conceived. And this was sort of the early 20th century. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, the principles of genetics were still just settling into view and coming into focus. Um, the structure of DNA hadn't even been discovered. That was like another quarter century away, um, let alone sort of how genes actually go on and off. And so there was so much that was still to be discovered. And we knew the barest minimum back in the first, first quarter of the 20th century. And yet, it was so easy and quick for political and social policies to be built on top of this rudimentary knowledge, and for America to introduce sterilization laws, and for uh, the UK to prevent the feeble-minded, as they called it, from reproducing, and for the Nazis to in, it, to come up with an entire philosophy of race and superiority based on these extremely rudimentary principles. So I think the thing to remember is that however much, and this is what Haldane would say, however much scientists think that their work is just at their lab bench or on their computer, uh, there is an entire society out there actively looking on at what is happening in these labs and extrapolating from there well before these technologies uh, are ready for use. And scientists, I think, have to be quite cognizant of that and live to that and and communicate and talk about their science the way that is doing right now. I think it's absolutely right that, that speculation is incredibly important in these areas and you know very much for the reasons that the, the others have have said. You, you can think of it in a sort of negative way. I mean in a way this is the sort of thing that, that um, Chloe was talking about where you were you know the assumption is the technology is coming whether we want it or not and we have to be prepared for it. You know, and sometimes it's described as anticipatory governance, sort of trying to think in advance what regulation we will need for technologies that will otherwise kind of catch us out or catch us unawares. Um, and that's clearly important. From another point of view, though, one can think of it sort of positively in, in terms of um, imagining the a whole set of possibilities and then deciding which ones we actually want not which ones we don't want and are kind of worried about but you know what would what might make life better if we had it there you know and, and it's it's precisely only by thinking around all these speculations that one can do that i completely agree and i think those two things go together i just wanted to jump in to say that i really appreciated what samant said as a as a, a bioethicist lawyer who writes about science sometimes it can feel like there isn't always space within scientific communities or within ethics communities for there to be like a really productive dialogue about these things. But I think that both sides of the conversation um, are, are really important. Do you distinguish between ectogenesis and ectogestation? Where does in vitro gametogenesis fit in? Um, it involves moving part of the human reproduction cycle outside the body. So it does seem relevant to Haldane's vision. 
I think the distinction between ectogenesis and ectogestation is really, it became really important in this debate. A few philosophers um, and I were having in, in the literature about what partial ectogestation actually is because some people think that partial ectogestation is a replacement for neonatal intensive care, is the deployment of rescue technologies. And so it's just exactly the same. Whereas there are a couple of us who have argued that actually this is something very unique and different. And there is something very distinct about gestation happening outside of the body. And it, so there's a distinction effectively between gestating entities and incubating them. And that might be meaningful for a host of ethical and legal reasons. And so the, the term ectogestation really came about, and um, Elslin Kingmer and Suki Finn um, said, we need to start using this word because ectogenesis really just means development outside of the body, whereas ectogestation means gestation outside of the body. And so in some context, when what we're talking about, being specific might be important. I get where you're coming from, that IVG is a really important part of this conversation. And actually for me, I think some of the reproductive possibilities about a world of, of, of liberation and particularly that quote, this idea of removing reproduction from sexual love, I think IVG in combination with ectogestation is where we might begin to see some of the most fascinating possibilities of people being able to build their families in very different ways outside of the confines of reproductive biosex. And that's really exciting. So I don't, when I refer to ectogestation, I'm just referring really to the, the process of gestating outside the body. I don't mean to exclude the other possibilities. Um, so the next question I'm going to go to is from Geraldine Jowett, who says, thank you very much to all the panellists. That's nice. Uh, out of curiosity, the separation of sex and reproduction as a feminist liberation was mentioned, but was LGBTQ reproduction at all a theme or mentioned as a motivation for ectogenesis in Haldane's works? So I can imagine he wouldn't be writing LGBTQ or plus or anything along those lines. But was that sort of a theme that was mentioned at all? It wasn't on Haldane's mind when he, he wrote the book. Um, interestingly, Bertrand Russell, who wrote two volumes in Today and Tomorrow, not just Icarus, but a, a second one called What I Believe, um, slightly later in the 1920s, is very explicit in, in um, arguing that you know the law has no business to interfere uh, with with what consenting adults do even if they're of the same sex Haldane's sister Naomi Mitchison um uh, authored a science fiction novel in I think 1975 called Solution 3 um which does involve uh, it's a more of a kind of feminist uh, utopia involving um homosexuality and cloning as uh, in part as solutions to overpopulation um so i mean surely by no means the only uh, uh science fiction work to, to to explore this issue but one that is connected to our our topic tonight Holden also wrote a science fiction novel um it's really bad i've read it uh, and it's unfinished but in that also um there's sort of a really artless plot device in which uh, a human professor here on here on Earth kind of thinks about or, or gets in touch with telepathically uh, an alien being in a different part of the galaxy and so on. And so anyway, in in this alien's different uh, world, uh, Haldane sort of musters every utopian notion that comes to him. And one of the things is that he populates the entire world with beings that are clones who are kind of bred according to the need of the world at the time. There is a paper in bioethics by Laura Kimberley and others which looks at access to ectogestation for sexual and gender minorities and what that might mean and um, I have a book coming out next year that also looks at some of those questions. I always encourage members of my team to read Brave New World. What do you think its impact has been on the sector? I'm assuming they're meaning the fertility sector here. It's become i think part of the the mental mental furniture um uh for people um uh, in and around the field and so in a sense you really you really need to know what's going on and it's quite useful to um actually to read it because it isn't all exactly what you might expect um uh i, I think um more specifically um the impact on, on people working in reproductive biology, fertility, reproductive biomedicine. Um, through 
the period since it's been written has been um, so often to shape the way in which they uh, either want to or feel they have to um, talk about what they're doing and what they're trying to do. I mean, one of the other uh, questions men mentions Anne McLaren um, when when she and uh, John Biggers wrote a piece about their work uh, on uh, embryo transfer um, in 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 mice in in 1958. Um, they have a section at the end, "Brave New World." Um, and that leads to a headline, Brave New Mice. So, so you know, people are, are using it to, to think with, almost inevitably, sometimes lazily, maybe most often lazily. Um, uh, but but, but um, by reading it, one can kind of activate uh, some of those cliches and, and I think um, make, make them useful to think with again. I'm going to go to a question from Richard Acton, um, which is related to that one because he says between the publication of Brave New World and now have there been any other significant works of fiction with influential explorations of human genetic engineering and he says he would nominate uh, Octavia E Butler's Exogenesis trilogy. There's The Growing Season um, by Helen Sedgwick and then I can't remember the name of the other one I think it's something like it's got dreams in the title. Not a particular book recommendation but it's a recommendation of an article by um, Andro uh, Domingo in uh, Population Development Review in uh, 2008, which coins the term demo dystopia um, and is a wonderful survey of um, films as well as uh, books that explore issues in population politics. Um, I mean, dystopia, um, these aren't the happiest ones. What are the arguments against partial ectogenesis for care of premature babies? Um, surely it can only be a good thing. When I say there are ethical and legal questions, all I mean is that, um, you know, there are things we need to think through in terms of um, what it means. So as I just mentioned, there is a, a debate still ongoing about what the ethical and legal status of an entity in an artificial placenta is. So I call it a gestateling, which just means the subject of gestation. Um, some people just call it a baby. Some people call it a fetonate. There's lots going on there about about what it is. And that raises new questions about things like, when can you turn off an artificial placenta? Do we treat that the same as, as end of life treatment or do we treat it like an abortion or, or whatever? So there's lots of discussion going on there. So that's just one example, but the, the, the debate is not so much about whether we should use it for premature care. The debate is about what it means when we do. Um, there is also some related feminist conversation, I should say, there's a great paper by Anna Nelson about whether if we have a better version of neonatal intensive care, could we allow people to end their pregnancies prematurely more often, um, almost as a, as a reproductive choice? So there are questions there as well. Most of the scientists advocating or developing ectogenesis have been male. To what extent might this vision be part of the continuum of technologies such as ultrasound, which allow men to have some form of access to their own developing fetus? It matters who designs it, what they design it for, and then how the how the device comes into being, because all of these things are going to be sort of uh, reflected in the design we eventually have. And um, there is a paper out in the Journal of Medical Ethics called Reviewing the Womb, um, that I wrote with uh, three other colleagues, including uh, Margot Brazier, Alex Malik, and Donya Begovic. And that reflects on what we can see in a future where we use ultrasound almost as an example of where we might be going with ectogestation. I worried when I first read um, Daedalus whether, you know, this wasn't a typical example of, of men wanting to take over, um, you know, the whole sort of business of, of childbirth from women. And you know, turn it into an engineering problem that they could understand. Um, but but what struck me as I read more widely in the Today and Tomorrow series was how many kind of women writers, and particularly the most feminist ones, seem to really warm to the idea. You know, so you've got people like Vera Brisson who wrote a, a, an interesting book called Halcyon or the Future of Monogamy, and she imagines a world where ectogenesis has just become normalized. You know, in the way Holden or Haldane's rather stupid undergraduate at least, uh, kind of describes it as having been. 
<clears throat> and also Bertrand Russell's wife, Dora Russell, who wrote a wonderful book called Hypatia, which is all about women in education. You know, she again thinks that this, this would be a great sort of boon for women, uh, ha having it as a, at least as a possibility. Um, so I think it's quite striking that, that really sort of educated feminist women at the period didn't didn't seem to feel threatened by it in the way that um, you know you you might think they might have done. Um, and of course, uh, you know there are there are later feminists like Shulamit Firestone who who sort of harks back to it as as an idea that could be seen as liberating for women. Doesn't um, Vera Britton then have a twist where they eventually abandon ectogenesis because the is it the maternal fetal relation is too important and they kind of don't the, the offspring don't develop properly or something claire horn's written about this she doesn't just throw in ectogestation and say tool of liberation she has a lot of caveats about everything we need to do in order to make that um you know possible she kind of really says ectogestation fab if we live in a world of gender and sex equality first. Haldane was such a combative man off the battlefield that he could start a fight in an empty room. Uh, do the panel think this aspect of his personality helped or hindered his contributions to science and human thought? He certainly wasn't the kind of person who made, you know, vast circles of friends, uh, but he was also very firmly of the opinion that a scientist had to be a contrarian first and foremost and i think um you know had to sort of challenge things that were given uh you know given to him by the previous generation of scientists for example had to do his own thinking about things um some you know he was as i mentioned earlier very quickly he was a a socialist and then a sort of card carrying literally member of the communist party in great britain um for more than a decade um and People have argued that that's sort of a product, it's a, it's a byproduct of his upbringing. It's, it's the influence of his first wife, who was a, a, a radical leftist. It was, the, uh, it was sort of a thought through uh, analysis of how science was treated in uh, the Soviet Union in the late 20s and early 30s, where he saw huge budgets given out to scientists to do their own work. And you know, people thought that that was why he came to this, this political philosophy. Uh, but one of his friends um, said this was just sort of Haldane's contrarianness creeping up all over again, and that if he had actually been somebody who had been born and brought up in Moscow, he would have been a blue-blooded Tory. And so, you know, this was just like, this was an, it, it was it was a pithy and maybe too glib analysis of Haldane's character, but there's some truth to it there, definitely. And the ways in which he sort of uh, challenged uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the accepted wisdom of scientific knowledge uh, in the time, 1920s and 30s. I think he might not have done if he was sort of a much more placid and easygoing sort of fellow. I mean, yes, all those all those kind of contrary and combative qualities, but also a, a kind of something that's um, surprisingly different from that, a, a real generosity about other people's work. You know that he wasn't combative in that context if he thought someone had had the idea before him he just said so he didn't try and kind of claim you know um ownership of the science he, he and, and that that is is really striking i think uh, did haldane or others a hundred years ago ever talk about how ectogenesis would allow for commercialization of fertility as a potential exploitation of vulnerable people not a liberation that infertility question is very interesting and of course particularly given that that turned out to be a problem Haldane had himself um I'm not sure I mean I don't know when he knew that he and his um first wife did actively try to have children and couldn't and I think by the time you know of course definitely by the late 1920s I feel like they'd almost given up um the letters that he exchanges with his wife about this are all from sort of the first half of that decade um and and there's still sort of no consensus on you know there's there's speculation that he had an attack of mumps when he was a child and that caused his infertility there's speculation that there was an injury that he picked up from a shell that burst near him in the first world war um uh, nobody really knows and so uh, but yes it was something that he dearly dearly felt like he he really felt like he missed out on being a father there is a, 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 a rather general understanding among uh, gynecologists in the period that uh, infertile people are 
uh, vulnerable to uh, exploitation. Um, but but Haldane, like uh, most other people thinking about the future of reproductive technology uh, in that period, are thinking about the state being far more involved and they're not thinking about the sort of commercial free-for-all um, that, that is uh, causing um, so, so much uh, problems today. So, so, so it, they're, they're imagining a very, a very different future from, um, from, from the one that happens when, uh, when IVF is, um, is commercialized through the 1980s. 